Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you have never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel. I cover true crime cases and all the cases that I cover are a little bit more on the vintage side. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload, which my upload schedule is very sporadic and whenever my mental health allows me to film. So make sure to have those post notifications on. I know that my subscribers are very, um, iffy when it comes to collabs and um, co-hosts and anybody who comes on my channel who's not just me, but I am going to have somebody kind of looking on when it comes to my filming and they may have some opinions in the background, so I do apologize for that. She's just gonna be sitting in the background making sure that I cover all of the facts that I need to in this video. She may have some opinions, you may hear some meows, so. <coughs> Today we're going to be covering another Vintage and Vanished case, which if you don't know what that is, it's a series on my channel where I cover vintage cases of people who have mysteriously disappeared, right? But before we get into the case, I do have to say that today's video is sponsored and it is sponsored by one of my favorite companies to work with and that is Magellan TV. Magellan TV is dedicated to bringing all of its viewers the highest quality documentaries. If you're someone interested in expanding your overall knowledge of an array of topics, then Magellan TV is for you. From some of the best filmmakers and networks from all around the world. Magellan TV is also adding new content every week. You'll never run out of things to watch and it can be watched anytime and anywhere. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. There's also no ads, so your content will never be interrupted. Out of personal opinion, their crime and mystery section is the best. The segment I am recommending today is a series called Nurses Who Kill. Have you heard of it? Have you heard of the series? Oh my. The title is pretty self-explanatory, but it covers different stories of nurses and caregivers who have killed their patients and pretty much goes over how easy it is for them to do that. Like how easy it is for a nurse to kill their patient and completely get away with it. It is crazy. It is a must watch. Magellan TV has over 3,000 documentaries. You will never run out of things to watch. I can promise you that. If you want to check out Magellan TV yourself, you can go to try.magellantv.com slash gabulosis and you can start your free trial immediately. All that being said, let's get right into the video. Today we're going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Johnny Hundley and James McQueary. John E. Hundley was born on January 13th of 1955 and James A. McQueary Jr. was born on November 3rd of 1954. The story takes place in Fairfax, Ohio, which is a village in Hamilton County, Ohio. It's a northeastern suburb of Cincinnati. It's a small area, a quiet place, and according to the 2010 census, the population population was at about 1,700 people. Not a lot happens there in today's time and honestly even less happened there in the 1960s, which is when this disappearance and this entire case occurred. Back then it was kind of an ideal place for a family to live and raise their children. There was a lot of children in this area, so your children would never run out of friends to have in your little community. There were what seemed to be good values instilled in the people living there. Most people were quite kind to each other and there wasn't really any kind of violence going on in that area in the early 1960s. It was honestly just a nice quiet place to live. No one really feared for their lives or children's lives living there until one main incident occurred there in 1964. Now this incident that we're gonna be talking about right now was before the one that this video revolves around. It's kind of like a pre-case to the main case. On Wednesday, August 19th of 1964, 
a four-year-old little girl named Debbie Dappin went outside her Fairfax home to play after she ate her lunch. Not long after, she completely, she vanished. Immediately, her parents knew something had to have happened to her because although she was very young, she was not the kind of child to just wander off. They knew something or someone had to have lured her off their property in some way. Her parents contacted the police and even for 1964, a huge search was done right off the bat. There were over 500 people helping in the search for this little girl. They were searching everywhere and even draining ponds very early on in the search. They had bloodhounds sniffing every property and the whole area was just chaotic. Then out of nowhere, a boy, a teenager, who was around 13 or 14 years old at the time, he comes forward and he says that he found a shoe near Little Duck Creek. Now Debbie's father takes one look at the shoe and immediately recognizes it as being his daughter's shoe. Panic sets in. Her parents know something horrible had to have happened to their little Debbie. Police though, they find it odd that this teenager just randomly found this shoe. So they decide to check out this boy's house, take a look around, see if they can find anything suspicious. Well, long story short, they ended up finding the remains of Debbie Dappen under the boy's porch. It had been covered up by some construction debris, but they found it and the entire area was just in disbelief. Police questioned the boy and the boy pretty much immediately confessed. He told authorities that he convinced Debbie to go over his home to play a game of hide and seek. This disgusting little boy really didn't want to play hide and seek though. He wanted to sexually take advantage of Debbie. When Debbie tried to fight him off and started screaming, he killed her. While Debbie's parents grieved, people in Fairfax were speechless. Speechless that overall, it was one of their own. Someone from the town and someone so young did something so horrible. This teenager responsible for Debbie's demise was known as a good kid, someone who never caused any trouble at all, someone who all the teachers and parents liked, and he did this. Parents started keeping a better eye on their children, but less than two months later in this same area, something else heartbreaking occurred. And that is the double disappearance that we are discussing today. Now back to Johnny and Jimmy. Johnny Hundley and Jimmy McQuarrie in October of 1964 were both nine years old. Jimmy being only a month shy of his 10th birthday. Both boys were third graders who attended Fairfax school. And these two kids were best friends. They were the very best of friends. These two did absolutely everything together and you would never see Johnny without Jimmy or Jimmy without Johnny. It was also pretty easy for them to always be together because like I stated, they went to the same school, but they also lived only a few blocks away from each other. When I say that these two were inseparable, they were inseparable. As we know, back in 1964, there wasn't as much to do inside the home as there is to do in today's time. They weren't sitting at home melting their brains on iPhones. Kids mostly spent their time outside, outside of the home. Being young boys, these two spent most of their time outside exploring. Their love for adventure was definitely something though that their parents in 1964 kind of told them to chill out with, especially the night before their disappearance when Jimmy went home and he was completely covered in mud and other stuff because the two boys had been playing around a construction site, a construction site with some sewer lines that were still being worked on, if you get what I mean. He was covered in mud and other stuff and his dad was not happy about it. Jimmy's dad told him that the next day, Jimmy better just go to school and then he better come home and he better stay home. No wandering around Fairfax. Jimmy, the next day, he did go to school and come home from school, but he didn't listen to his dad. A little bit of time 
being at home, he was bored. And on October 15th of 1964, he left the house through the back door and met up with his best friend, Johnny, and they were gonna go out for the day. They had some stuff that they were planning to do that day. So Jimmy and Johnny, they were definitely curious cats, but on Thursday, October 15th of 1964, the day of their disappearance, they weren't in some strange location wandering around seeing what they could get into. They were making a normal stroll to a place they visited frequently, which was Frisha's big boy. If you're not from America and you've never heard of Frisha's, which I say America, but it's not everywhere in America, it's in certain states, Frisha's Big Boy is an American restaurant that serves mostly American food like burgers and grilled chicken sandwiches, and they're especially known for their tartar sauce, which is absolutely amazing. I love Frisha's, but that's not what this video is about. Anyways, if you know anything about Fairfax, Ohio, the main liner Frisha's, it's very talked about. The main liner Frisha's has been there forever. That's pretty much why it's so talked about. And it's located at 5760 Wooster Pike in Cincinnati, Ohio. And yes, it is still open today. Jimmy and Johnny, they went there all the time and it really wasn't that far from their home. So they were able to walk there. It was a good place to just go in and out of and get a quick bite of food or some refreshments while they were on one of their little local adventures. They always paid. But there was one incident about a week before they disappeared where the boys didn't have the money to pay and they kind of just left the restaurant. Overall, they were known for being good kids, but you know, Jimmy was the one though who owed the money. And when his parents found out what the two did, they were extremely upset and they gave Jimmy the money to go pay the restaurant back. I do have to make it clear that Jimmy was given the money to go pay the restaurant back, but he wasn't told like, you have to do it this next day. He was just told like, go pay them back at some time, go make things right. On October 15th, that's why they went there. They had to go pay the money that was owed for the stolen previous order. The money they owed though, it wasn't much. It was only a little more than a dollar. And according to Jimmy's father, he gave Jimmy $1.04 and that was the amount that they needed to pay back. So they went inside, paid the money back to a waitress and left. This was at about four o'clock PM. Hours started passing and both Jimmy and Johnny's parents were at home wondering where the two may be. The two were known to wander, but they were always back home when the sun started setting. Did they just lose track of time? Were they acting out again? Or did something horrible happen? Jimmy and Johnny's parents communicated with each other about the missing boys. For Jimmy, it was both of his parents. They were both still alive. And for Johnny though, it was just his mother, but also kind of his older sister, Bonnie, who had taken over the role as another parent since his father had passed away a short time before. At about 10.30 p.m., they decided to phone the authorities about the missing boys. And at the very beginning of this case, when police were first notified about the boys' disappearance, they were not worried. Police were really not worried at all. We have heard the story a million times before about authorities not being worried about a disappearance, thinking the person or people are just runaways or are out there somewhere and will be back eventually. That's pretty much what they thought about these two boys. Yes, in reality, most missing children are found very soon after they are reported missing. But do keep in mind that little Debbie Dappen was just murdered two months earlier in the same area. You would think that maybe police would be a little more concerned about two boys who were missing and no one could find them. They told Jimmy and Johnny's parents though that the boys probably lost track of time or were out wandering somewhere and that they shouldn't think too much about it, that the boys will probably show up soon. But the police would be wrong. As time passed and the boys were still not heard from or seen anywhere, authorities started taking the case a little more seriously. One of the first things done was learning about where the boys may have gone that day. They discovered Jimmy's father gave Jimmy money to pay back Frisch's at some point, and they headed to the restaurant. They ended up speaking to the waitress who took the money from the boys the day of October 15th. This waitress told authorities that she did take the money from the boys that day, but that the boys, they didn't give her a dollar and four cents. 
She said that the boys handed her a $20 bill. This was extremely odd information to everyone. No one had any clue where the boys could have gotten a $20 bill from. The waitress said that the boys told her that they found the money, but they didn't say where they found it. It's very strange when you think about it that they broke this $20 bill instead of just giving the waitress the dollar and four cents that was given to Jimmy by his father. Why break the bill? Also, of course, the obvious question of where the hell did this $20 bill even come from? According to Johnny's older sister, Bonnie, she claimed that the last day she saw Johnny, he had some empty soda bottles to cash in. He would have gotten money from that, but definitely not $20. You're probably wondering like, why is she so hooked up on this $20? But $20 in 1964 is about $175 in today's time. That's why it's so weird. Where did this money come from? Still to this day, people have no idea. Authorities though asked the waitress if she remembered which direction the boys left the restaurant in. She said that she did remember seeing the boys leaving through the parking lot, but she said that she didn't watch them long enough to see which direction that they headed towards. That was pretty much all of the information the waitress was able to give police. Authorities wanted to learn more about the boys though, and especially wanted to know about the boys' history and if there were any places that they have ever been that they were not supposed to be in. After talking to Jimmy's parents, they learned about what happened with the construction site the night before the boys' disappearance. You know, the incident where Jimmy and Johnny had went to the construction site and got all muddy and covered in other stuff. So, the police headed over to the construction site to see if maybe the boys went back there after leaving Frisha's. They searched around the area, dug everything up. In the end though, they couldn't find a thing. Nothing of any connection to the boys was found. So it didn't seem like the boys went back to the construction site, or at least it didn't seem like their remains were there or they were trapped anywhere in that area. So authorities started looking in other places around Fairfax in wooded areas, buildings, abandoned buildings, parks, ponds, anywhere you could think of but still nothing. Because they could not find any clue at all to lead them to believe the boys were still in that area, authorities started thinking maybe the boys had left the area. They were thinking again that possibly the boys were runaways. The boys' parents though did not believe this for a second. Yes, Jimmy and Johnny were a little daring when it came to where they decided to roam around for the day, but they always came back home. Authorities, on the other hand, they were like, well, the two of them are nowhere and were last seen with a little bit of cash on them, so who knows. Police did what they could in that situation and told departments in surrounding areas to help spread the word of the two missing boys from Fairfax, Ohio. Thursday was the day the boys went missing. The next Monday, four days later, they had their first breakthrough where someone came forward with some new information in this case, a new eyewitness report. And this one came from someone in a location that was very unexpected. On October 19th of 1964, a man, a train inspector, came forward to authorities saying that he had spotted the boys and spoke to them early Friday morning. Location, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Yard, which in today's time, that railroad is not still up and running. Its last operating year was 1987. But anyways, he said that early on Friday, he had spoken to the boys very briefly. According to him, one of the boys asked him where the train was supposed to be going, in which the train inspector replied, St. Louis. This man said that Jimmy and Johnny were basically just kind of like playing around the railroad yard, and he told authorities that he was certain that he had spoken that day to Jimmy and Johnny, the missing boys from Fairfax. This man gave a spot on description of Jimmy, but he said that the other boy was standing kind of back out of his main sight and that he didn't really get too good of a look at him, but he was certain that the main boy was Jimmy and because he was certain that the main boy was Jimmy, the other one had to have been Johnny. This man's story, it, it does kind of make sense because a railroad was the type of area where the boys would kind of 
play around in and explore and see what they could get into. What he had to say about Jimmy and Johnny also made complete sense to the boy's parents because when it came to Jimmy and Johnny, Jimmy was definitely the leader, the one who was more outspoken, the one who made all the plans, which Johnny was more reserved and followed Jimmy's lead. So when the man said that he had seen Jimmy and Johnny that day around the railroad and that Jimmy was kind of more up in the front talking to him and had things to say and Johnny was off to the side and he didn't really get too good of a view of him. Like that made complete sense to the boy's parents. This was huge information in the case, but it made the case now a bit more difficult to take on for authorities. The man's story of seeing them that day at the railroad yard could not be 100% verified, but it seemed like to many that he was telling the truth and that the boys may have been Jimmy and Johnny. Now authorities had to look at the case from a wider perspective. They thought that possibly the boys left the area, but now it looks like they really might have if they actually hopped on the train that day and headed towards St. Louis where the train was going. Next thing authorities did was the logical thing. They reached out to the St. Louis station to see if anyone had seen the boys there. It didn't seem like anyone had. They sent missing persons flyers to hundreds upon hundreds of departments here and far, especially in St. Louis. They asked train inspectors to search every single car on the train that was there that day heading to St. Louis to see if the boys were still on any of them. But again, even with all this effort, nothing. They found nothing. No new information came forward. After this man had come forward, this train conductor saying that he had seen the boys early Friday at the railroad yard, a little bit of time passed and the boys were said to have been seen at another area revolved around transportation. This time, an airport. A man was reading the newspaper when he read about the disappearance of Jimmy and Johnny. Immediately, he went to authorities about it. He told them that on Saturday night, which would have been the night of the 17th, he saw the two boys washing up in the men's restroom of the Lunkin Airport, which is located at 262 Wilmer Avenue in Cincinnati. For all of my viewers who are location fiends and love to know the layout of where everything is, the airport is about four miles southwest of the Frisches they were last seen at on the 15th, two days before. After authorities heard about this man's claim and how he said that he had seen the boys at the airport washing up in the restroom, authorities, they went to all of the stores and the airport and they were asking everybody if anyone else had seen the boys there that night. From my research, the only people that really came forward to back up this man's claim were two employees at a restaurant in the airport and this was a waitress and a bus boy. These two employees basically said that in the restaurant of the airport, they saw these two boys sitting at the restaurant for over an hour, over an hour of time. And one of the employees said that one of the boys had on a shirt that was blue and yellow stripes. And that is the same exact style of shirt that Jimmy was wearing the day that they went missing. Did one of the employees just see the description of the boys in say a local newspaper and just say that they saw the boys there that night and say that one of them was wearing a similar shirt to the shirt that one of the missing boys was wearing before he went missing or did they really see the boys there that night on Saturday? Well, if they really did see the boys there that night, then that means that the two did not get on the train the day before on Friday morning. Possibly they were just in the railroad yard playing around while they were on their way to the airport, but we don't know. Police decided to now set their eyes on the airport. They searched that airport everywhere, asking everyone working there if they had seen the boys. No one else really came forward. They looked in all of the restrooms of the airport. They looked in all the back rooms and closets. They looked in garbage cans and in bushes surrounding the airport. They looked in the surrounding land, even by helicopter. They found nothing else though. The two boys didn't hop on a plane or anything, they knew that, but where were they? Police, they kept searching and searching and questioning people, but it never really led them to where they needed to be. It always was just sightings that seemed so legitimate, but they could never get anything solid from it. They were never able to get any physical evidence or any clues, anything 
that they could hold in their hands, no items of clothing or blood splatters or fingerprints, nothing. This case seemed to have hit a dead end until three years later in 1967. In September of 1967, a 17-year-old Marine recruit named Gary Lee McKee, who was stationed in San Diego, California, made a confession to a minister. During this confession, he told the minister that he had taken the life of two boys when he lived in Fairfax back during the year of 1964. Gary was originally from Fairfax, so he was from that location and familiar with the area, and he definitely would have known of any murders or missing persons cases in that area, so keep that in mind. According to Gary, he and another guy, a guy who in 1967 was living in Indianapolis, had taken Jimmy and Johnny out to the woods, stabbed them to death, and buried them. Authorities took this confession very seriously. So they brought Gary back to Cincinnati for questioning. He told authorities the same story and said that he would tell Fairfax police where the bodies were buried. So obviously everybody was extremely excited about this. I mean, they didn't want the boys to be deceased, but they wanted some sort of closure for this case to be solved. So they were really, they really had their hearts set on finally somebody came forward and we can just have a conclusion to what happened to these boys. Well, Gary, he led police everywhere. It was insane, one place after another. Johnny's mother, she was actually there with authorities every place they went with Gary. And he just kept leading them here and there and they never found anything. They ended up digging up all of Gary's backyard of his home, a ton of other locations. It was a mess and they never found anything. In the end, get ready for this, Gary basically broke down and told authorities that he didn't actually kill Jimmy and Johnny, that he only made up this entire confession so he could get out of the Marines and go home to Cincinnati. They ended up giving him a polygraph test and he completely passed, which of course, you know, polygraph tests are not great tools to prove somebody's innocence, but back then they gave him this polygraph test and he completely passed. And this entire thing was just main word heartbreaking to the boys' families. To be strung along like that and it going nowhere I couldn't imagine. Gary, he was homesick, he missed his friends and family, he wanted to go back to Cincinnati. Well, he got his wish for a short period of time and people looked at him as a murderer and then when they found out the truth or what Gary said was the truth and he passed the polygraph test, they just handed him back over to the Marines and were like, here you go. So in the end, Gary didn't really get what he wanted. Now, just as a researcher of this case and going through online information, I couldn't find much online about the other person who Gary claimed supposedly helped him kill Johnny and Jimmy and dispose of the bodies. But in today's time, whether Gary was involved in the boy's disappearance or murders is still up for debate. There was an article done for WCPO Cincinnati where they spoke directly to a retired detective who worked on the case and Johnny's older sister. And their opinions are very split when it comes to Gary. Detective Mike Murphy, who is the retired detective, thinks Gary just wanted to get out of the Marines because the Vietnam War was going on overseas and he probably didn't want to be shipped off. Mike Murphy thinks the boys possibly died at a construction site and that they're under something somewhere in Fairfax. Johnny's older sister, Bonnie though, believes that they should give Gary another polygraph test and see what they can find out with today's technology when it comes to him and his involvement in her brother and her brother's best friends disappearance. From what I could find online, it doesn't really look like authorities, since this article came out a few years ago, have looked back into Gary. Now this case has led people and authorities 
to a lot of different locations. And the last one we are going to be discussing is Foxborough, Massachusetts. Yes, an area that is over 800 miles northeast of where this story takes place. This new tip came into Mike Murphy some years back. A woman from Foxborough wrote to him in an email that her father was the one responsible for killing the two boys from Fairfax. Mike Murphy and the police chief of the department at the time drove all the way up to the area of Foxborough to speak to this woman, her mother, and her sister and hear what they had to say about her claim. From what I read in the article, after speaking to the woman, Mike Murphy said that it was obvious that she had some psychological issues, but she told them that her father had abducted the boys killed them in the basement of their home and buried them under the home's porch. That's what she said occurred all those years back. Like I stated before, Foxborough is a location 800 miles away from Fairfax. I couldn't find much information in this article on what she had to say about the distance and why her father would have been in Fairfax and how he transported the boys and the story behind that and I couldn't find any of that. But authorities searched the porch, dug up the area, even brought in cadaver dogs and in the end they found nothing. The two ended up driving down to the Kentucky area where the man currently lived and after speaking to him directly and after finding nothing, they they had to discard her story completely. All in all, it has been 55 years since these two boys vanished and there are so many theories in this case. Mike Murphy said that there are about 50 to 60 theories in this case. It made nationwide news back in the day during a time when kidnappings did not really make nationwide news. And even all this time later, they still receive new tips, but none of them, and just like in 1964, right after it happened, have brought them any closer to solving this mystery. Johnny and Jimmy were both nine years old when they disappeared and at the time that I'm making this video they would be 66 years old. If you have any information about the disappearance of James A. McQuarrie Jr. and John E. Hundley, you are urged to contact the Fairfax Police Department at 513-271-7250. You can stay anonymous. These right here are reconstruction photos done by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children of what the two may look like if they are alive today. So that is the unsolved disappearance of Johnny Hundley and Jimmy McQuarrie. And there are so many aspects to this case that remind me of other cases that I have just recently covered on my channel. For instance, everything with Gary and him leading police and family to all these different locations and making them dig up here and there, and oh my God, no, it's over there. It's the same kind of circumstance as the Erica Baker case with Christian Gabriel and him leading people to all these different locations. It's like the same exact thing happened in both of these cases. And then of course, them disappearing after leaving a restaurant, it reminds me of the case of Myron Tamel trailer. He had left the OK Fish and Chips and these boys had left a Frisha's. And it's weird because these are both areas where people are going in and out of to get food and drinks and nobody really saw anything. Jimmy and Johnny's families, from what I found online, it doesn't seem like any of them believe that the two are still alive in today's time they're kind of going through the same thought process as so many other families, just hoping that they can eventually find their remains to give them a proper burial. And I also have to mention, of course, that the siblings of the boys have entered their DNA into the system. So if there are any John Does that are ever found, it will match up and they will be able to tell if the John Doe's are Jimmy and Johnny or not. So far, that has not happened. Like Mike Murphy said, there's just so many theories in this case and I'm sure after I do this video, my subscribers are going to come up with even more because you all seem to come up with so many interesting theories, theories that I have never even thought of myself. And I've had family members tell me the same thing that they looked through comments and saw a comment that really made them think. And I think one of the main aspects of this case that really makes your mind wander is the fact that there's two main modes of transportation involved in this case. And that of course was 
a train and an airplane. I don't really think that they got on that train or that airplane, but it does, it, it kind of makes your mind wander to different places. Most people who look into this case, and me personally, I don't really think that they got on the train going to St. Louis or that they managed to hop on a plane. That would have been very hard to go through security and get on a plane. But you never know if possibly they were on their way to the airport and then at the airport they met somebody who offered to take them somewhere else and maybe this person had just got into the airport. You never know. You never really know how far they could have been taken away from that area of Cincinnati. We've discussed other cases on my channel where it had to do with kids who were adventurous and then they disappeared and nobody knows if possibly something happened to them on one of their little adventures or if somebody was responsible. It just, there's so many unanswered questions with cases like this and you just have to hold off and hope that their remains are eventually found or that possibly somebody comes forward with new information, information that finally gets them somewhere or possibly a deathbed confession. It, like every single case, it just takes everything falling together. But with all that being said, I do want to send some love to the families of Johnny and Jimmy and all of the loved ones of them who are still hoping for some sort of resolution. And I hope that my subscribers as well go down in the comments and send some love their way. If you have any recommendations for cases that you want me to cover on my channel, make sure to send those to gabbyloisiscaserequests at gmail.com. And I do have to remind you all that next month in September, is solved September so send me some of your solved case recommendations and I will see you all in the next video.